The speed is everything. Or is it? I don't know. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Drum Technique Podcast. Before we start off, I want to thank everyone for the great feedback we got after releasing the first episode. The comment section on YouTube was filled with great positive feedback, so thank you very much for that. So today I'm happy to welcome Rolf Pilwe as my guest on the Drum Technique Podcast. Within the next 60 minutes you're going to learn how Rolf got into drumming in the first place, how he developed his foot technique, how he set up his bass drum pedals, how he worked on his hand technique, how he got the chance to play drums for Wintersun and Stratovarius, and so on. And that's actually it for this short introduction. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this third episode. Don't forget to leave a like and a comment underneath. Also don't forget to follow us on iTunes and Stitcher and feel free to contact me if you want a specific drummer to be the next participant on this podcast. Bye. Rolf, first of all, welcome to the Drum Technique Podcast. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's start with question number one. At what age did you start playing drums and did you start to play metal right away? Mm, I think I started around like six, seven years old. Mm -hmm. I got really fascinated by music, music really early on. Like my dad had really good record collection and I used to listen like old Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and stuff like that. Oh, great. And then I started to bang the boxes and, and yeah. <laughs> that's it, like after how, uh, maybe half a year I get my first drum kit. Then. Mm -hmm. So did your father play any instruments as well? Uh, he was just a fan of music, just like a fan. Okay. music lover. Okay, and when you decided that you wanted to start playing drums, was it okay maybe I'm gonna start guitar and drums or bass or something else or was it like I just want to play drums? I guess I just get, got like fascinated by drums by seeing like Nico McBrain playing mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in my dad videos like old Iron Maiden live stuff like I just got really fascinated by the drum kits and that's it. Perfect. Next one. Which double bass pedal would you recommend for someone who is just starting out? Mm, I, I guess the best idea would be just start with like some mid range like really basic double bass mm -hmm. thingy like maybe going with chain drive or even like direct drive if you want to invest a little bit but maybe like for a beginner it's just better to start with like normal pedal so to speak mm -hmm. and uh, now my question is froze. what was <laughs> what was your first bass drum pedal uh, i don't remember i just bought it like got six yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i think i got my first like Double pedal around like 10, 11 mm -hmm. year old. It was some old pearl from shop. It Doesn't was remember. pearl already. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. It was a used one. Really, yeah. really shitty, broken. But <laughs> yeah. I managed for many years with that. Okay. It was good. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It works out for you. That's great. Yes. Which double bass pedal are you using right now? Uh, I'm using Pearl Eliminators, mm -hmm. Red Line. It's brand new. The thing. new series, yeah. Yes. Do you see a big difference between the regular old Pearl Eliminator, which has been around for like 10 or 15 years, to the new Pearl Red Line Eliminator? Mm, I don't know. I think they are pretty much the same pedal. Mm. Maybe they are a little bit different, like there's like these red things and everything. But mm. like in overall, I think it's mostly the same pedal after all. Did you ever try um, belt drive as well or did you always play with chain drive? Mm, I have been experimenting with like belt drives and mm -hmm. stuff. So, also like single chain drive pedals ah, okay. and stuff like that. So, okay, yeah, trying out things. That's an in, uh, that's an interesting thing because you just mentioned the single chain drive. You know, I already saw you playing in Berlin like a couple of yeah. months ago, and you're like really hitting extremely hard, and also your your pedals are like really taking a beating at every show. Um, did you have any, any bad experiences with a single chain drive pedal, like the, the chain is like ripping off or something like that? Mm, they haven't ever like broke down, but like maybe the biggest difference if you compare like single, like single chain to double chain is like if you're doing like swivel that I'm using. Okay. So when you are doing this pivoting kind of thingy, the single chain is so kind of light that the pedal actually does a little bit of this uh, like, like more lateral, compared to like okay like lateral motion yeah yeah right. yeah okay so 
it still works with a single chain, but the swivel technique. Yeah, but it, yeah. actually, it just just feels better with um, two a double chain drive. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. maybe a little bit. Okay. At least it feels more durable, mm -hmm. and safe. Yeah, safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's one more thing. I we all we already talked before the interview, and I know that Rolf has um, Pearl Demon Drive at home as well. What are your thoughts on the Demon Drive? Because the chain drive works out well for you, but you also got experience with the direct drive pedal of Pearl. So what are your experiences with that pedal? Mm. Well, basically the only reason I changed to kind of this more simple pedal mm -hmm. is that I'm touring quite much and with Demon Drives there's so many different like small parts and actually can broke down also. So every two months I had to get like spare parts and stuff. So it's just like I, I love to keep it simple, mm -hmm. less okay. parts to uh, like mm -hmm. that can break down. I got that, yeah. It's mm -hmm. also like totally counterintuitive because most drummers say, okay, I'm gonna buy like the most expensive, most complex pedal as long as it helps me reach my goal easier. But when it all comes down to for you right now, it's like, okay, uh, you, can be, you can play on both pedals, obviously, on the yeah, chain yeah. drive and the direct drive. But you prefer the chain drive because it's just a simpler pedal, just a workhorse pedal. Kind yes, of. Okay, yes. Okay, so that's not gonna, that's gonna Are you faster with the direct drive or is it just the same thing but a bit different feel? Mm, I don't know, I, I haven't really tried, but like, I think I would maybe get like maybe 5 BPM or something like that. Okay. Or out of that. Mm -hmm. It's easier to keep it moving when you get it mm -hmm. like to the motion. But yeah. in overall, I think the difference would be so small that it doesn't really matter after all. Okay, okay. Next one, what sticks do you use and do you prefer lighter or heavier sticks in general? Mm, nowadays I'm using mostly two Bs. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I'm using Los Cabos drumsticks. Los Cabos, yeah. Yeah, they have been actually really great. They are using this red hickory, which is kind of a little bit heavier mm -hmm. and also a little bit thicker, I think. Mm -hmm. So they are extremely durable which is something I really appreciate, yeah. <laughs> not breaking sticks after every song. But in my opinion, like it's easier to play fast and longer with bigger stick because you get more like energy out of that. If you mm -hmm. can just use the rebound to help you, it's 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 same with pedal. Like I like to use like Wood and Peter and if I just get it to move, the actual mass helps me mm -hmm. to stay in motion. Do you trigger your bass drum, because we just mentioned it before, and if so, which triggers are you using right now with Winter Sun? Yes, I trigger mm -hmm. with Winter Sun. Uh, I'm using this Roland RT30, I mm -hmm. think, yeah. the mm -hmm. newest model. Yeah. And then I have this Roland TM2 module mm -hmm. with our own sample, and it's been working really great. Yeah. Like, which kind of sample? Is it, is it the same sample that's on the album or is there yes, like some... Yes, yes. Okay, that's the reason. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, regarding trigger settings, uh, did it take you long to dial it in and make it work? And do you uh, have any adjustments on the bass drum to get a perfect trigger result? Mm, I haven't tweaked like with that, that much. Like only thing I'm actually interested is like the threshold. And mm -hmm. that's something I'm, I'm tweaking depending on the bass drums and the heads a little bit. But usually I try to make it like that. I have to give like a good stroke to get the sample out just to get rid of the false trickering. Mm -hmm. Like especially in middle, like middle tempo and slow, slow stuff, it's really easy to get like false trickering with yep. like triggers that take the signal from the head mm -hmm. if you are burying the beater and like there's resonance and all that. Mm -hmm. So it's a fine mm -hmm. line. It's a fine line, so, yeah, yeah. but you're always like, during, before every gig you're checking back on the trigger settings, okay, is it working, do I have to like change the threshold a bit? Yeah, yeah I'm so always checking like, that, okay. just in case. That's a good tip. Yes. Really yes. good, thank you. And head tension, bass drum head tension, like really tight bass drum right? or not mm. so tight, like lo really loose? Finger tight. Finger tight, okay. Yeah, that's maybe a little bit loose, over, yeah. okay. like extremely <laughs> Okay, loose. but that works fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And blankets or pillow in the bass drum? Mm, it depends no, no. on the bass drum. Okay. Also, so like 
Yeah. So Enough you, stuff, so mm-hmm. to speak. Okay. okay. <laughs> you, but you got some stuff in there, but it's not like yeah, totally yeah. full with like blankets. No, no, stuff. no. Okay. Let's start with your hand technique. Which grip are you using when playing fast single strokes with your hands? Actually, I'm experimenting with switch grip. Ah, that okay. you have been teaching. Like I can advise you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I have the okay. lesson before the show. Mm-hmm, yeah. So I can actually play. <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, yeah. Uh, when the winter sun thing came up, like I was playing mostly like extremely loud mm-hmm. things or extremely soft like jazz kind of yeah. stuff. But not really playing like single strokes for like many minutes That's straight. It. So uh, I really had to think about like how I will get my hands to work like in three weeks to play blast beats that I haven't been playing for many years. You had only three weeks to prepare yes. for the for the first show with Winter Sun. <laughs> yeah, in summer Priest for okay. twenty five thousand ah, people or great a small gig. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was a little bit stressed. But that's then. good. That yeah. makes you grow. That's yeah, a challenge. In, yeah, it was a challenge. It still is. But yeah, I really had to think about my hand technique. I actually, of course, first I just tried to do like with my old technique mm-hmm. and just survive from the first gig. <laughs> but after that, it's been like constant thing, like experimenting, trying a little bit different things. I have been practicing heavily on French grip, trying mm-hmm. to get my fingers like work because I think the endurance thing comes yeah. from there, and of of course mixing it with wrist a little bit mm-hmm. after all. But I've been really working on French grip, speed and endurance. But on the playing situation, I'm using like mix of German and changing the French grip. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, so actually, yeah it's actually the I, it, yeah. yeah, it's kind of working. I have had really good okay. gains Great. with that. Cool. But it took like one year to get my fingers and French grip together. Uh-huh. So yeah, back before the winter sun gig, you just played mostly from your wrists, like in German yeah, wrist and turning full motion. arm, like okay, like that. So no, almost no finger involvement. Yeah, at all. yeah. Okay. Only rudiments, but it's so different, okay. like yeah. motor <laughs> thing. That that's true. But when you worked like on your single strokes and on your speed to prepare yourself for the winter sun gig, did you uh, practice on the pad for the speed or like directly on the drum kit? Mm, when I started, I just practiced with the drum kit. I played the songs and mostly like blast beat parts, mm. I slowed them down. Like you have like software like amazing slowdown and stuff like that. Mm. You can like slow things and also make them faster. Mm-hmm. So I used that. I played blast beats a lot, <laughs> like just looping <laughs> the parts that there's blasts yeah. and trying to get comfortable, which mm-hmm. kind of didn't work, of course, like that <laughs> yeah. in such a short time. But after the first show, I really started to shed on pad and like, like I'm still doing it mm-hmm. a lot. And even during like touring, we had our first tour in like last September, October. Mm-hmm. I was like practicing maybe two hours before the show already like practicing my singles and like mm-hmm. trying to get my technique together. And with Arch Enemy, like I did the same. I had my practice pad set. Mm-hmm. I practiced two hours before the show, and actually I also practiced like one and a half, two hours after the show. Just oh, really? To, yeah, I, I just want to get this thing together, so you had to work like, hard. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like qui- as quickly as possible. Yes, yes. For the winter sun gig, did you also focus on hand speed and hand endurance, or was it just like from the time you started playing for winter sun? Uh, it was mostly from from like the winter sun gig came up. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, I had to maintain my mm. hand speed in a way, but I was more like concerned with like sound and with Stradivarius it's like every hit have to be like 127 velocity so to speak. So trying to make my sound mm-hmm. as sound mm-hmm. as possible and playing as loud as possible, which is completely different ball game mm-hmm. com- compared to like blast beats. True. So yeah, I worked that but with such a different goals so to speak, and I was... That's yeah, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. You know, that's like really for our audience as well, especially for every drummer out there who's playing for more than one band. Uh, what Wolf just said when he is um, playing for Winter Sun, it's a different thing sound-wise and they 
you need a different sound for Winter Sun than, for example, if he plays for Stratovarius. It's like a big difference. Yeah, yeah, know? definitely. And actually, you're, um, it's not just like one technique that um, lets you like reach that goal. You have to be like more versatile. Uh, Stratovarius like big arm movements, like big, loud <laughs> play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in the toms as well, which you need a lot of power for that. Yeah. And on yeah. the other hand, Winter Sun, more like, yeah, single strokes, of course, <laughs> fast single strokes, continuous blast beats, uh, more finger involvement as well. Yeah. Yeah. More so, finesse, more so finesse, to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for someone who is just starting out playing drums, do you recommend working on hand speed and endurance on the practice pad or directly on the drum kit? Mm, I think in every situation you should do both because practice pads will feel completely different compared to like 16 inch tom mm. and also if you are just a beginner beginner like i don't know if the speed is actually like crucial thing like more like just trying to make right movements try to learn how it should feel to play single strokes and also thinking about the sound like try to make it make it as consistent as possible if you want Mm -hmm. working on accents as well because they will open up so much like possibilities to play mm -hmm. and like maybe also working on like movements on the set like just trying to make make yourself more agile mm -hmm. first because you get your basics from that and then you can play already like music and then you st can start increase yeah. the tempo you got a point there that's like let's talk about that for a bit because it's not just like practicing rudiments and motion on a pad or on the drum kit. It's also like yeah. moving around the drum kit. Yeah. Do yeah. you have any Definitely. specific exercises? Like, let's say, you know, you're metal drummers, okay? Yeah. And yeah. I'm also speaking from experience here. The main thing is if you want, especially tom fills. Yeah. You're at the snare and your first tom is here. You got like five different, you got three rack toms and two floor toms. Yeah. yeah. You got from the snare all the way around to the floor tom at let's say 240 BPM. Okay, have fun with that because you have to practice that stuff. How did you work on that to make it like fluid because you want fluid 16 note single strokes and not like being like, okay, block A before hits is the snare, then Tom one that you hear like different blocks of sound, yeah, yeah. you want it to be fluid. So how did you practice it? Uh, well, I have been doing like tons of just moving around, like playing like, for example, four strokes on every drum hmm? and Maybe when you go like the last floor tone, mm -hmm. you can do like uneven amount of strokes mm -hmm. and you will get your lead hand to change left. to the left and you mm -hmm. can come like with the left hand yep. again back to your snare. Then you just do, do the same like uneven mm -hmm. amount of yeah. strokes and you can do this kind of go kind like of this. Up and down, yeah. yeah, yeah. And also like working on like accenting things like on toms and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and just trying to concentrate on not doing any unnecessary movement when you go from drum to drum. So mm -hmm. really analyzing like what you're actually doing because there's high possibility that when you go from snare to like first tom you do like something like completely mm. waste of energy yeah. kind of thing there. Mm. So just trying to get like motions together. Mm -hmm. And even like practicing like maybe like even one stroke at a time and really analyzing like okay, now I do this, then I move here, like what happens there and mm -hmm. like really being really analytical, like about the motion. Yeah. That's great advice. Thank you for that. Cool. Okay. Since we've been talking about tom fills, <laughs> yeah. now let's stay with that topic. Do you change your hand technique when it comes to tom fills in comparison to regular blast beats? And the reason I'm asking this is if you play a blast beat on, like, let's say, the right symbol and the snare, mm. it feels totally different, especially when it comes to the rebound in comparison to a floor tom. Yeah, so. yeah. Mm. Well, I mostly use like German American mm -hmm. grip, like maybe more wrist, still fingers, trying to stay as loose as possible. Uh, I usually use a little bit like Muller kind of thing mm -hmm. there. If I play like, uh, I play lots of like this kind of portnoyish oh, feels okay. like yeah. having <laughs> bass drums there because I'm too lazy, yeah. I, I guess. But yeah, I'm always trying to use some kind of accenting maybe there and try to get as much 
like stick to the work mm -hmm. in the tone feels yeah. like so just trying to stay really loose and use the energy I can get from the stick Double bass full technique at slow and mid tempos. Let's dissect your technique for a bit. Are you using a mix of hip flexors and calf muscles or is it just hip flexors at tempos from 0 to 160 beats per minute? Mm, I would say it's mostly hip flexor thing, like mm -hmm. until maybe 140, 150. Mm -hmm. Depends a little bit on the day, I, I guess. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, after that, there's some ankle movement coming in. But mostly it's like flat food technique mm -hmm. until that you're not swiveling at the tempos uh, at times i can do it like in 150 160 mm -hmm. but, but uh, yeah yeah it's not necessary mm -hmm. but in some patterns for example i might use swivel if there is some some kind of easy patterns mm -hmm. that okay. just very, it's it's really matter of what I'm playing, really. Okay, okay. Yeah. But let's stay with the regular heel up technique right now. Yeah. A mix of hip flexors and uh, calf muscles. Yeah. How did you start working on that? And the reason I ask is because a lot of drummers out there, um, they get to a certain point, for most of them it's like 130, 140, and they are like suddenly stuck. At yeah. Least yeah, Because at this point, either the calf muscles want to take over and they can't control the tempo anymore and have, uh, start to play way faster or they don't reach the tempo at all. So how did you start working on that? How did you, what did you practice? And how long did it take you to get that stuff mm. done? Well, I had like huge, huge problems when I started double bass drumming. Like, I was just like lost, like how I can play like constant 16s for <laughs> over 30 seconds. Same here. <laughs> yeah, 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 I was really much into power metal back mm -hmm. in the days mm -hmm. when I started that and of course I wanted to play power metal. <laughs> so uh, then I ended up like in this Derek Roddy for mm -hmm. some stuff like that and people were talking about like, just doing like tons of repetition and like playing long times and I basically did like a few years just like 10, 10 20 sometimes half an hour just 16 playing constant 16s with, with my feet. feet. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about technique at all because there wasn't that much information avail available back mm -hmm. then. But like, I remember like when I started this 10 minute thing, like just playing without breaks, mm -hmm. yeah. it started really slow. And next day I went and I had the best gains I have had like in two years of playing double bass or okay. something like that. Mm -hmm. And things clicked and I, just kept on doing that because yeah. it worked so well. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Did you start to playing, uh, when you practiced that stuff, did you practice that on the drum kit, on the pad? Drum kit. Drum kit? Yeah. And yeah. did you also accompany yourself with the hands or was it just like a, met a metronome, stopwatch and 10 minutes straight? Or no, no. Improvising mm -hmm. most of the time with mm -hmm. hands. And I, I also had this exercise like, uh, Having this like maybe like five basic beats I usually mm -hmm. play in the wider world songs. Yeah. I have to play to maybe like two minutes of every of those beats just to make like this ten minutes go a little bit faster. Because okay. there are days that it can feel like eternity yeah. to do that <laughs> like same thing. Yeah yeah. And later on I start to do like rudiments and like experimenting with different stickings and just try to get like total freedom while mm -hmm. doing 16s with my feet. I'm ah, still okay. doing it quite much ah, okay. every day. So, okay, that's like one exercise that you like still do. Yeah, not, yeah. On a constant, not daily basis, but constant basis, yeah. Yeah, nearly daily basis. Nearly daily basis, okay. Yeah, it's ongoing Great. process, okay. so to speak. Did you ever just practice double bass on the floor without the pedal as well? Mm, I did some. But it was more like for a memory game, like trying to get like some parts from the songs mm -hmm. to my muscle memory or preparing to practice yeah. later, like maybe next day, just like okay. transcribing <laughs> while okay. playing the floor, mm -hmm. so to speak. And sometimes some endurance thing, but I didn't really have confidence that how does it affect. But now that I'm actually doing your bass drum course, I've been <laughs> experimenting Perfect. with this floor practice. It's, it's killing, it's really good. Okay, you're great. Everybody, everybody should do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Again, I didn't pay for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's great stuff. 
But um, one more thing, uh, heal down technique, because of course I saw you playing and you're like one of the few metal drums you also with Winter Sun you're hitting really hard, you're playing really loud. Oh, so it's thanks. like that's your thing. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, like Ilo Casagande of Sepultura is hitting really hard, you are hitting extremely hard as well. Um, when it comes to double bass, obviously you're using regular heal up double bass to a certain point. Yeah. Did you ever practice heel down as well? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Uh, that's something I have been doing like on and off for like last maybe 10 years. Uh, what I have like felt that it, it have really helped like feeling the rebound. Mm -hmm. Like that's one thing like if I do like a few minutes of just like really good heel down strokes with both feet. After that it feels like that I kind of regain my control mm -hmm. to a pedal. So that's something I really recommend everybody doing. Okay. Even for five minutes a day or something like okay. that, it, yeah. it, it can help. Okay, foot technique at faster tempos. How did you work on your control and endurance at tempos from 180 up to 220 beats per minute? Mm. Well, I use wiggle technique mm -hmm. while doing uh, faster tempos and it, first it came like naturally just doing those really long endurance kind of thingies yeah. and I noticed that if I can do like 10 minutes of 160 BPM I probably can do a little bit of 200 BPM. It's weird how body mm -hmm. can work. Yeah. Uh, but now that I have been more involved playing like faster tempos uh, playing songs, of course, it's really good. Also slowing them down and also playing them faster if you can. And then, then also like doing single leg work, like mm -hmm. really concentrating on controlling the pedal and try to yep. make like the stops and starts like mm -hmm. really sharp. Yeah. Uh, just playing lots of single strokes. Like I usually do like every day this like playing like maybe, maybe like one minute or two minutes of constant single strokes at uncomfortable tempo, so to speak. And just doing What's that with... What's an uncomfortable tempo for uh, you? Well, I'm still kind of struggling with like 190, mm -hmm. 200 maybe for it's a really okay. long time. Yeah, okay, yeah. But uh, I'm getting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, I'm changing that with like... Maybe I do like two, two minutes with legs, then I do a blast beat for two minutes and do that kind of mm -hmm. ramping up the tempo little by little. Just working on my endurance and trying to make it feel like as relaxed as possible mm -hmm. while still okay. being on that kind of out of your comfort zone, so yeah. to speak. And one thing that I can find really helpful also like doing this, this kind of laddering the tempo thing like you go like up 5 BPM, then you go down 5 B BPM, mm -hmm. then going up like 10 BPM and you just go a little bit like laddering the tempo and always yeah. going back down a little bit so you can actually make the, those little bit uncomfortable tempos feel easier uh, after you have done okay. some little bit faster mm -hmm. stuff. Ah, okay. And even working like just with like 1 BPM differences yeah. when it's like near the yeah. maximal tempos. Yeah. One thing that's also going to be really interesting for everyone who's watching right now, since we talked about shortly that you uh, back to the swivel technique, that you can play the swivel technique at 150 already. Like yeah, some, yeah. Some for, during a regular, let's say, a regular winter sun gig, at what tempos do you start using it live on stage? Is it at, always at 150 or is it faster tempos where, where you like really start consciously start to use the swivel technique? Mm, I think the swivel actually comes comes up around like 180 mm -hmm. BPM. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. what. I, yeah. Yes. Yes. Even like 170 BPM, like, but mostly we are doing 180 mm -hmm. up from that, and then like 100 to 160. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. easy to okay, kind yeah. of to decide <laughs> Perfect. which to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the swivel technique and go more into detail and about yes. that one. Could you explain how you first started practicing the swivel technique and please also talk about advantages and disadvantages of this technique? Yes. Uh, I first saw like swivel technique in Derek Frody, this instructional video mm -hmm. that I originally ordered from US. Yeah. A VHS video. Was tape. it the one with the red background? 
Yeah, like the the purple, purple yeah. drum kit, the <laughs> <Okay>. legendary half <laughs> yeah. an hour yeah. video mm-hmm. tape. Yeah, and I saw that he was doing like with his left foot mm. the swivel thing, and then in my own practice when I just pushed myself little by little, I noticed that wait, wait a second, my foot kind of does the same motion. I don't even know if back in the time there was this thing like swivel, <laughs> like. Yeah, I think it just... It yeah, came up later. It came up but, later, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's something that my feet just tried to do naturally. Mm-hmm. Around like 150, 150 okay. BPM or something like that, doing those 10 minutes, mm-hmm. 15 uh, minutes. Long, but, uh, yeah, yeah, like, exercise. yeah, yeah. It, it, I think it might come up from just like my body trying to kind of divide Mm-hmm. The energy you know, <laughs> expenditure, like different muscle groups, okay. a little bit same like with like push pull and mm-hmm. molar things that uh, co- yeah. comes up naturally after mm-hmm. after a while, so to speak. That's true. So I think that's that's the thing. Since you just mentioned the push pull, when you're using push pull, you got a downstroke and an upstroke. Yeah. Most of the time, one stroke is louder. So my question right now is, when it comes to the swivel technique, to your swivel technique. Um, uh, both hits, like with one foot right, your heel is on the right side of the pedal and the left side of the pedal. Is it the same volume or is it like one is louder than the other? I try to make it uh, okay. as, <laughs> as constant as possible, but yep. there's, there's like little sound difference, mm-hmm. at least now. Okay. <laughs> and now <laughs> but that's something I'm always like. Now we are starting to nerd out here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Swivel technique. Um, when you start with the swivel technique, let's say with your left foot, yep. um, do you first swivel in to the right side or do you swivel out with your heel for the first stroke to the left side? Out. Out, okay. Yeah, every time. But do you wind up, like your heel is moving in to wind up and then you're moving out for the first stroke or is it just from the middle, your, your foot is on the pedal, like in the middle of the pedal and then you're just moving out from there? From the middle. Mm-hmm. From the middle, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's good because this looks way more economic than, okay, if you would have to wind up before every stroke or every yeah, leg. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, you got that down. And how, because a lot of our viewers um, are using the swivel technique and a lot of them have the same problem, which is a different volume between those two strokes. And you just mentioned that you are also working on it and yeah. try to like, of course, the goal, you know, I always bring this example with uh, Slayer, Angel of Death. Just imagine, like with each foot, that every second stroke would be played softer than the first yeah, one. Yeah, it indeed. wouldn't sound so, let's say, it like politically correct, it wouldn't sound so great. <laughs> so how do you work on evening out those strokes when it comes to volume? Mm, I think it also comes up to just doing like right motions and mm-hmm. putting right much of like uh, right amount of like pressure to each stroke. Mm-hmm. And thinking about like really like what you are doing and what causes the difference mm-hmm. there. Uh, one really good thing that have helped me is just like doing it quite slowly, like really slow tempos and just trying to think like about the motion. Slow. Yeah, like super slow and just try to do exactly the same movements, uh, other than moving your leg from side to side like mm-hmm. but otherwise it's it there should be like same amount of ankle and maybe even a little bit hip flexor mm-hmm. but when i'm doing it faster it feels like i'm floating actually like i try to get this really light floating feeling okay yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah the next nerd question <laughs> <laughs> do you apply pressure on the footboard because i think that also makes a big difference do you apply pressure on onto the footboard with your toes or with the ball of your foot? Mm, I would say it's, it's, it's more like a ball of the foot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't add pressure before like 210, ah, okay. something like that. Uh, I try to just keep it really relaxed and so like you're working floating. With the and different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Again, let's stay with the swivel technique. Um, spring tension and footwear. Spring tension first. Do you recommend starting out when you start practicing the swivel technique, low, medium or high spring tension? Mm, I would go with medium. Medium? Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like your beta settings and uh, your pedal settings look pretty basic, like 45 degree angle. Yeah, uh, nothing medium fancy. spring tension. Okay. So like yeah, just basic, basic yeah. like 
Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the reason, at least for me, is that just that I'm playing lots of other stuff than mm-hmm. fast double play, bass, yeah. even with Winter Sun. So I want the pedal to be like this. I want it to serve like every situation, mm. okay, best yeah. possible. Of course, it's a compromise with mm. maybe a speed and stuff like that, but yeah. still, it's mm-hmm. better overall. Okay, think. and it, when it comes to footwear, do you like? Prefer like really flat surface um, to make like this wibble a bit smoother, or can you play like with every kind of shoe? Mm, well, I would say that I like like really hard shoes mm-hmm. from the bottom. Like if it's like a rubber shoe, and if the rubber is really soft, mm-hmm. it starts to kind of melt. There's like this friction yeah. going on, mm-hmm. and it can actually get quite sticky and you notice it when you have been doing like 30 seconds of doubles and then you start to feel like oh shit this is feeling kind of <laughs> sticky somehow like and it can affect yeah. the endurance mm-hmm. in a way so I like like hard bottomed shoes. Okay. When you start and stop a bass drum pattern do you press your bass drum beater against the bass drum head or do you stop right before the bass drum head? Mm, with mid tempo stuff I usually bury the beater. Mm-hmm. So I'm having a little bit of pressure on the pedal if I'm not playing it. Yep. But it depends also a little bit on the context. Like mm-hmm. if there's no double bass coming up yeah. for a while, then I'm just resting, so to speak. Yep. So I will let the beater come up mm-hmm. from the head. But if I'm playing like rhythmical stuff and like controlled stuff, mm-hmm. it's always like bearing the beater. Mm-hmm. It feels like that you get control out of that. Yeah. Because those can be really, really tough to play like this 140, 160 yeah. <laughs> syncopated yeah. mm-hmm. beats. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you, let's say we are at the tempo of 200 beats per minute. Yeah. And you know, okay, right now there's like a, this big double bass section coming up with just straight 16 notes of double bass. Yeah. You, you know you're using the swivel technique. Um, before you start off, do you like press the beater against the head and then start swiveling, or is it like okay, it's the beater is resting shortly before the bass drum head and then you start swiveling? I would say that in that situation, it's maybe one centimeter away from Just the head. Just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Double bass practice. Do you ever get fatigued and tired? And if so, do you take days off of drumming? And I'm gonna tell you why I asked this because you already talked about your practice routines when it comes to double bass and what you did in the past and the exercise you're still doing now, which is really focusing and pushing the endurance part. Um, but a lot of my students have the problem that they, they practice a lot. By a lot, I mean, okay, they practice like five or six days a week. Yeah. They haven't been practicing before, so their body is not used to this motion. And at a certain point, like it's just over, their muscles are done. And if they don't take a break, they're gonna hit this wall and they're not gonna progress any further. So please, Give us your advice. Did this ever happen to you that you get fatigued like that? And if you take or took days off, how long did you take off? Mm, that's something I'm actually always thinking about. And like, it's probably one of these things that I have to get more focused, like this the whole resting thing and recovery thing, mm-hmm. because I'm practicing like extremely yeah. <laughs> a <laughs> lot okay. every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, I will get fatigued like every day and that's <laughs> okay. my goal basically mm-hmm. when pushing myself. But I can notice that like if I play, let's say, two weeks without off days, at some point the performance starts to kind of mm-hmm. go other way around and it doesn't help like if you just continue to do the thing. But I think the best solution would be like just try to kind of program you are practicing somehow that you get like recovery like every other day or some some kind of little bit like compared to like gym mm-hmm. gym yeah, thing yeah. like yeah. but that's something I'm, I'm gonna experiment but the last year have been so hectic and trying to mm-hmm. just get fast as possible yeah. <laughs> so so yeah I have been pushing myself like probably mm. quite <laughs> seat height any advice and important points on the topic Mm, first of all, I think everybody should like listen to their body mm-hmm. and also think about like leverages, like how long legs you have and everything. Like I think the seat height is a little bit like 
connected to how far from the bass drums you also mm -hmm. sit. It, it kind of affects really uh, much like your posture and everything. But I would say that at lowest you should go to this 90 degrees classic okay, kind okay, of like thing. Okay, like hip joints and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I like to sit a little bit higher, maybe like five centimeters, something like from there. And it, it comes up to this flat foot technique and using like hip flexors. If I'm using them, then I maybe have like this mm. around 90 degrees angle mm. in my hips. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems to work really well for me. Like if I go higher, I usually start to get a little bit fatigued in my lower back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also the same thing happens if I go too low, my mm -hmm. lower back starts to kind of tell me that you should maybe go okay. a little bit higher. Okay, <laughs> yeah. And since you also talked about the position of your drum stool in comparison to the drum kit, if you're sitting like yeah. uh, closer to the drum kit or further back, what about that? Do you sit like close to the drum kit or are you sitting further back? Mm, I would say it's medium because mm -hmm. I have quite short legs. So even if I'm sitting close, maybe compared to some other guy, mm. I'm still like having this, maybe like if my hips are here, the angle is like this, okay. so it's not like under the knee. So it's the more leg. than 90 degree angle between yeah, yeah. the upper leg and yes. the lower leg. Okay. Just slightly. Just slightly, okay, but yes. obviously. Okay, perfect, thank you. Are there any non-drum related exercises you do in order to stay in shape at the drum kit? Yes, I love the power lift. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I used to do calisthenics for like few years, just pull ups and like body weights, mm -hmm. body weight training, which is really good. I think everybody should try yeah. it. Yeah, try it. And then I got more into like this powerlifting thing, and I think it really helps actually, like doing squats and like also deadlifting, like and really getting a posterior chain. Mm -hmm. and get stronger yeah. because mm -hmm. you're using it all the time all the when you're sitting mm -hmm. and like moving and playing drums. So having a really good posterior chain, it's like you will get many more yeah. good years sitting behind the kit from that. True. Yeah. And also like all kind of like rear delt stuff you can do, mm -hmm. rowing, pull-ups, everything that involves your back and upper yeah. back somehow. It helps with the pos like posture. Mm -hmm while sitting yeah. and drumming kind of feels easy after <laughs> squatting and <laughs> deadlifting and yeah. many times a week. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> but there might be also like downsides, like downside with that because it also eats up your recovery somehow. Mm -hmm. That's something I am, I'm thinking at times, like how it affects my like physical like development with drumming. Like yeah, yeah. If it actually takes away from finger control training to squat. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah, like squats and let's say, for example, standing calf raises and double bass drumming. Yeah. That's like, okay, because the one is like really focusing on moving a lot of weight and the other one is like uh, extremely quick contraction of your calf muscles. So it's like total opposites actually. Yeah. <laughs> You are working as a full-time musician. How do you manage to stay in shape at the drum kit when you are on tour? And also how often do you practice per week when you are not on tour? Mm -hmm. Well, I practice all the time. Like <laughs> even, even when touring, I have this practice kit or at least a pad. If I have like shorter tours or festivals or something like that, I still need that half an hour, hour mm -hmm. just to prepare myself. So yeah, I, I, I'm always trying to get better with my instrument and mm -hmm. I can really feel that if I don't play for a week, which it doesn't happen that often, but mm. uh, it takes some time to get back in shape, so to yeah. speak. Mm. So yeah, while touring, maybe like one hour to four hours practice every day. Okay, it's a lot. And when at home, I try to practice like three to eight hours every day. It depends a little bit like what I'm working mm -hmm. on, like if I have record sessions or stuff like that, of course it means that I have to learn new material as well. So mm -hmm. it, then it's like 
practicing technique for a few hours and then learning some songs. Okay, because that would be my next question. Okay, it's like yeah. a technique block, a couple of hours, if you're practicing eight hours, for example. Yeah. A couple yeah. of hours technique, hand and foot technique, and then practicing songs. Yes, okay. yes. It's always clearly defined what I mm -hmm. want to do. Uh, since you just mentioned uh, the practice pad and practice setup, um, like your smallest practice setup that you bring on tour is like a practice pad? Which one? Mm, I'm now using this Pearl mm -hmm. Star okay, uh, yeah. print okay. thing. Okay, noted. This is like a 12 inch. Yeah, I yeah. think so. And for the feet? Mm, I have this real feel. Pad. The real feel uh, based on practice yeah, pad? Yeah, it's with and, that, and do you practice like with double pedal backstage or in the hotel? When you're uh, on tour? Backstage. Backstage, okay. Yeah, yeah. Stadium, yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, that answers the question. Right now you're playing drums for Wintersun and Stratovarius. First tell us how you got those two gigs. Mm. Well, the funny thing is that I didn't actually apply for, for neither. Either, for <laughs> <Okay>. either. <laughs> yeah. But Good for you. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but I think the trick is here that I, I used to like work full-time musician already before. I was playing like loads of like different gigs, like top 40 every week and mm. I used to have this really heavy jazz thing, like playing five, six jazz gigs every month, mm -hmm. like just doing a job as a freelancer. And what you gain from that is actually the contacts for the business. And then of course, like there's many other metal musicians doing that stuff as well if they're like really career driving mm -hmm. yeah you just yeah. want to make your your living by playing music mm -hmm. so i had really good connections and the Stradivarius thing came up like Matthias contacted our guitar player contacted me through facebook like if i would be interested to come to audition mm -hmm. i went there uh, i had four songs to learn but i actually learned the whole set list I checked out all the like live endings and the latest like mm -hmm. lists and that comes to like preparing like it's been one one thing that I think it's really important like preparing and doing mm -hmm. more than you are mm -hmm. asked and it comes from also doing this freelancer thing because you yeah. might have learned like 100 songs every week at some point yeah. and yeah, that's how the Stradivarius thing came that's up. Like mm -hmm. I went there, we played like eight songs. After all, mm -hmm. there, yeah, everything yeah. was recorded. Really? And oh, really? They recorded the first practice session as well. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's yeah. <laughs> there's that, no that, room for failure there. It's no, like no. <laughs> but the funny thing is that we did this father time fast song, and I didn't have any clicks. Like we were mm. playing like rock and roll rehearsals. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the tempo actually stayed in 160 from beginning to end without the click, well, which perfect. was like so it was the perfect compliment. Like. Nice time, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great, yeah. <laughs> which was surprise. Yeah, but that's when my career as a metal musician kind of started again. Mm -hmm. I, I had long period of playing jazz and like concentrating on groove and like like just playing different styles and being yep. Yep. as versatile as mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. not even practicing double bass or yeah, anything technique it, yeah. related maybe more like jazz phrasing and mm -hmm. stuff like that but yeah after that I get back to the metal then and then I have been playing mostly Stradivarius until, until winter something mm -hmm. uh, how did that come about? Uh, Teemu asked like because we have this cover band run for a cover mm -hmm, doing all yeah. these special <laughs> okay. special songs like Ingvi Malmsteen and Dream Theater and okay, all yeah. that funny funny <laughs> things so yeah in rehearsals with that he just asked like if I would be interested and I was like thinking that oh man you are like choking like I'm not like extreme metal guy like in any sense like and I felt like that I, I wouldn't fit like anyway mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but yeah then he asked again like a few weeks later and mm -hmm. later and there was like two other guys as well 
that I actually suggested that would be like perfect for that job. Oh really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, suggested but, other dramas as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I thought that I, I uh, won't be like the right guy for like, that job. Like. You win the award for nicest person out there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah. So it's yeah. part of being professional, I think, as well. Like, if you yeah. have that feeling that this might not be like, well, I won't be able to pull it like mm-hmm. as I would like. Yeah. It's sometimes <laughs> kind of professional to give some options as well. True, that's true. In that way. But yeah, then they wanted to see like me playing this Sons of Winter as Stars. I had like two or three days to learn it. <laughs> Okay. And it have this 220 ppm blast beat that I can couldn't do. Yeah. And I'm still like struggling and like it's my goal to get it to feel easy, of mm-hmm. course. But yeah, I, I managed to play the song somehow. Blast was of course terrible at the time, but mm-hmm. I got all the details that Kai, the original drummer, had played like mm-hmm. I was really detailed, like practice every single symbol thing and everything okay. from yeah. there and learned that and I guess I played it the tightest after all. Oh ah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got the gig, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Okay. From that. Mm-hmm. Um, then a few weeks later I was playing in Summer Priest. Okay, and that that was your first show. Yeah. Yes. Wow, uh, there are two things that were really interesting. So this would be like if I had a son and I would give him advice on how to become a touring musician and enter bands like Wolf did, Winter Sun and Stratovarius at the same time, almost at the same time, it's like number one, networking. Talk to yes. others, play a lot of gigs, help out at different gigs, gigs. Don't think that you're too good for a regular wedding gig. Um, or Everybody should do skin. it like actually, yeah. Every, uh, <laughs> that's also yeah. Awesome. all the lessons you can learn from music you, you learn from, from wedding, wedding gigs. And like, <laughs> yeah, if you want to be a professional, you have to do them a lot yeah. of them at some point, at least for a bit of time. Yeah, yeah, true. Indeed. That. Indeed. And the second point that was like really their thing is go the extra mile. For Stratuarius, the example is like perfect, it's like a textbook example of that. You were asked to prepare four songs. You prepared eight and you played all of them. With yeah. Them. So yeah. that's how you make sure that you get the gig. Yeah. Yeah. You Great. kind of have the advantage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're yeah. like when you go in. Because you're putting in the work. You're yes. doing the extra mile, and if you're able to like play tight as well, because it's not easy during the first rehearsal with the band. If they also say, okay, we're going to record the session as well. So yeah. Of course, yeah. they're going to come back and listen to it over again, and so. Congratulations on both gigs. You, Thanks, man. you really Thanks, man. deserve that. Wow, great. Okay, so what are your plans? Like gigs, tours, studio sessions, and so on for the rest of 2018. Mm, uh, after this tour with Winter Sun, we are now playing in Vienna and Munich, and then Wolfzeit, mm-hmm. Germany. Wolfzeit, yeah. Yes. After that, we will have Pasadena Rock with Stradivarius next week, next weekend. Yeah. Uh, after that, actually, I will have one month of no shows at all. But mm-hmm. I will record one album with my friends. It's kind of this Alice in Chains meets Corn kind of. <laughs> okay. A little okay. bit different stuff. Really fun. Yeah. And yeah, during that time, I'm also preparing for Stradivarius tour, starting from first of October. Oh, okay. And it goes up until first of November, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something like 25, 26 shows. Yeah, and after that we have some club shows in Finland with Stradivarius mm-hmm. in November, and then if we are lucky, maybe we start to do Stradivarius album somewhere in like December. Yeah, okay. December. I also have one other album session coming <laughs> there, so okay. it's going to be lots of yeah, preparing, are... learning, okay. transcribing. But you are really busy. <laughs> The rest yeah, of, for the rest of the yeah, season. I yeah. try to. Great, yeah, you keep yourself busy. Yeah, 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 yeah it's great. You have to do it. Okay, all right, Paul. Well, first of all, thank you very much for all the advice, especially the career advice is pure gold, in my opinion. Technique advice, really interesting, especially the swivel technique. And I'm going to show you an example of Wolf playing the swivel technique in a couple of minutes. And now, Wolf, your final words for our audience. All right, just keep practicing and have fun and keep on working things you are interested in and try to try to have some goals 
just work hard and you will get faster. faster. Double bass. Yeah, it's <laughs> speed is everything. Or is it? I don't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, Drum Technique Podcast, episode three, we are done and we are out. Cheers. Cheers. In this first example, you can see Rolf playing heel down. He is generating each stroke with his calf muscle, and after each time the beater hits the pad, he is lifting his foot again with assistance of his shin muscle. Note that his upper leg is not assisting at all. Right here you see Wolf's technique at slow and mid tempos. He is mostly using his hip flexors to generate each stroke. His calf muscles are only assisting this motion. In this example you can see Rolf starting to swivel at tempos around 150 bpm. You can see that his hip flexors are still lifting his foot for each stroke and his ankles are moving from side to side. Once the tempo increases, Rolf stops using his hip flexors and the whole motion is just generated by his calf muscles. His ankles are performing the swimming technique. One thing that is really interesting is that he is not using a really extreme form of the swimmer technique, so his ankles are just moving from left to right a bit. Alright, that's it for the third episode of the Drum Technique Podcast. The thing that I found really really interesting was Rolf was able to get his hands and feet up to speed within a short period of time when he prepared for the Winter Sun gig. His career advice on how to get session gigs was pure gold in my opinion. If you follow these guidelines that Rolf laid out in this episode, your chances to get really good session gigs increase a lot. I've already got a couple of drummers in mind who I want to invite to be a part of this, so don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to make sure you don't miss the next episode. You can also find this podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so make sure to follow us there as well. I hope you enjoyed this one. Don't forget to comment below if you want a certain drummer to be a part of the Drum Tilling Podcast. Until next time, cheers from Vienna. Bye. Since Rolf talked about his experience with powerlifting during the podcast, we decided to test our strength and that's why we did a little bodyweight exercise dip challenge. My goal was pretty simple, just do more dips than Rolf. <laughs> and here's the end result. All right, you're on okay. dip challenge. Oh. One, two. Seventeen. <sighs> nice. Ready? Okay. Uh, One more. Uh, I'm done. <laughs>